Welcome back and thank you for joining me. Marriage, that's what we're talking about today. Um, and I asked you to send in your your comments and the question is marriage overrated. Now, uh, we've got a tweet here. Lots of modern women want weddings, not marriages. Staying together is a choice. The marriage certificate doesn't really do much. It's a bit of paper. So is it? So oh, is it? Well, figures from the Office of National Statistics show that 2021 was the first year that more babies were born out of wedlock than in wedlock. Marriage rates have also been declining since the 1970s. So Max Bloomberg is a, a psychologist, a registered psychologist, and he wrote a piece saying 13 reasons why people don't want to get married. Let me give you an example of some of the things he wrote about, and he, he follows them up really well. Um, traditional reasons for marriage no longer matter in as much as that traditionally women needed the economic stability and social mobility of our marriage. Uh, well, we don't need that. We've got career, uh, careers, having babies, looking after the house, whether you're married, married or not. People marry when they're happy. We're less happy. Growing acceptance of living together, uh, high divorce rates, paint a bad picture, no evidence that marriage makes you happier and healthier, especially for women. Uh, don't single men, single men live five years, on average, five years shorter. Um, when they're cohabiting or when they're married, they live five years longer. The reverse, I believe, is uh, uh, true for women. We live five years shorter when we're married, and we live five years longer when we're not. That's what they say. I want to check out that. Cost of weddings is another one. Uh, and that cost of weddings is on the up and up. Women are fine doing motherhood alone. People don't want to invest. Being born out of wedlock no longer has the stigma that it once did. Lack of married role models and sexual liberation and the pill. Well, that's what Mike Max Bloomberg draws our attention to. Now, on the other side, we have Michaela, Michaela Hyde from the Marriage Foundation. I had a quick Google as to who they are and what they do. Um, the mission of the Marriage Foundation is to be a powerful, independent voice, restoring confidence in marriage using the best and latest re research. We, one, advocate the advantages of marriage, two, challenge the social injustice of uh, injustices uh, surrounding family breakdown, and three, demonstrate that marriage is both modern and the best arrangement for all couples. So to kick this off, I want to start with Max Bloomberg. Max uh, is a psychologist who said before. Max, thank you so much for your time. I actually thought your article, I think it's brilliant. I think it's brilliant because you know, it's it, it, marriage is an institution a little bit like when well, it's been going a lot longer than the National Health Service, but it's something that's kind of just there. Very rarely do we get to actually examine uh, how the relevance of it, whether it should be updated, and, and just think about it. So just, just give us your outlines about why, you know, why when you see figures like more babies being born out of wedlock than in, and the declining of marriage, why you're not so shocked? Uh, Patricia, thanks. Um, I, I'm not shocked particularly because I think that marriage is just not a priority for couples like it used to be. I think that we've got so much going on in our lives these days. It's harder to make a living. There's strikes going on. We don't have the disposable income. Cost of houses are going up. If we have to prioritize all the things that we'd like to do, marriage just isn't up there. I think we're more in a survival state uh, at the moment rather than marriage. So what I'm saying is that marriage sounds more like a nice to have been an essential for many people at the moment. Now, you, you point out, I mean, historically, we should cover this, that once upon a time, if a woman was going to survive in the world, she had to get married, didn't she? So just point, if you will, that that, that, that basic history, the ground, the bedrock of what, why marriage began and why, you know, why it's there, compared to how things are today. So, so it was very much a patriarchy uh, patriarchal society that we used to live in, and men ruled primarily through strength, and we still see indications of that, you know, the Tate uh, thing, for example, we see that going on. Yeah, marriage, marriage was a way of ensuring that your offspring were your genes, because a lot of this boils down to evolutionary psychology, you know, we are animals but with a thin veneer, um, 
And it, it was one way, marriage was a way of keeping your female partner, your wife, in line, you know, chastity belts, all these things are patriarchal control devices. The women had no power in society to work, to generate their own income. They were completely dependent on their male partner, their husband, husbandry, the word husband comes into this. And then we move the 60s and women's liberation, followed by feminism coming up in the 80s, 90s, and women started fighting and saying, you know, we want our independence, we can generate our own income, we can have jobs, we are as good as men. In fact, we are finding in some fronts that women are demonstrating more adaptability, you know, adapt or die, more adaptability than males are. And for that reason, for some women, marriage actually feels like being tied down because you've got this income, you can manage the home yourself. What value is a guy going to add to your life? And so that's the state we're in today, where uh, particularly women, but people in general, it's not a priority. And women are saying, what's, what's in it for me? Again, remind me. And that's the issue. Now, you know, we've had messages coming in already. Uh, we're trying to get Michaela or I, uh, Michaela up on the, uh, I think we'll get her up in a minute. But men say nowadays they feel that marriage is weighted against them because when it breaks down, they're the ones who have to leave the home, they're the ones who have to pay the alimony, they're the ones that don't get to see the kids. So we talked about it from a female point of view. There's obviously a body of men out there who are saying, you know what, modern marriage, you know, is it, it, stacked against men. Yeah, and, and I think that, uh, again, from an evolutionary perspective, men are not noted for their desire to have uh, to stick around with one partner evolutionarily. Uh, they like to go around. So marriage has never been a really as high on the agenda for males as it has been traditionally for females. And so I don't think it's going to take right. many excuses for men to say, you know, we, we don't want to get married. Uh, so that's kind of what you're seeing. And, and in any case, as you pointed out, the courts, you know, when they're saying who gets to keep the kids after a marriage, you're right. It, you know, a female would have to do something very wrong for the court to say uh, that she's not going to be the one to keep the kids. So stacked against them um, is that you could say society uh, acknowledges that women make a better parent. If you have to choose between two, women generally make a better parent than the male alone. So that, yeah, so you can understand why men are, some men are saying that. We're just trying to uh, get uh, Michaela on it. Maybe we can just get her on the phone if we can't get her in, in a picture. Now, um, when you when you, we look at marriage, some of the things that you've gone through, one of the things you say that people marry when they're happy. Now, a lot of studies are showing in this day and age, in, in Britain anyway, people aren't as happy. Yes, you know, happiness is a funny one, uh, Trish, Trisha. We have a thing in science and in research that we talk about that, that correlation is not causation, which I'm sure you you've heard of before. So if one event happens, it doesn't mean it causes another one. So, you know, does marriage cause happiness in people? Or is it the other way around, maybe? Is it that happy people tend to get married? So happiness causes marriage, ah. rather than marriage causes happiness. And the research is very ambiguous. We haven't sorted that out yet. We know, by the way, that uh, if you are, if you score high on uh, neuroticism or low on emotional stability, same thing. It's a very famous personality test. Well, you can do it uh, online, five-factor personality. If you have a high neuroticism or low emotional stability score, chances are you will end up in an unhappy relationship. So neuroticism equates to being unhappy a lot of the time. And if you are living with a neurotic person, you will not be having a good relationship, married or cohabiting or whatever. Right, let's just bring in now uh, Michaela, as I said uh, before. Uh, Michaela Hyde is from the Marriage Foundation. They talk about the powerful independence of uh, voice restoring confidence in marriage. Michaela, when you hear this, what are your thoughts? I mean, you know, Max has done this piece pointing out why people don't get married. So for people listening to all of this, it made a lot of sense to me, and I am married, yes, 
Um, I'm not talking about my current marriage, but I can absolutely see where, where Max is coming from. What are your thoughts on, on this? Uh, there's somebody been listening and saying, yeah, marriage is stacked against men, and women no longer need that. You know, they can do things like go out to work themselves. They can have babies themselves. They can do all of that themselves. They don't need marriage. They can choose it, but they don't need it. Well, what's interesting is that there is absolutely an innate kind of sense within all of us to, to seek um, reliable love, to be with somebody. Um, and what we've found in certainly in a lot of our surveys and our research is that continually people do actually, despite all the challenges, still aspire to be married. We did a survey with 18 to 30 year olds and more than 80% said I would like to be married at some point. So despite the various kind of arguments that are being put forward as to why people might not marry, those people still want to be married. And actually, one of the biggest things we've noticed on, with our research is that high income families, sort of 87% plus, continue to be married. OK, so huge numbers of people are still marrying. And it's the low income families who so are not. You, sorry to jump in there, but Kayla, Sorry, sorry to jump in. Did you say high income families tend to be married? Yes, yes. So, right. but, but Max, Max, can I just ask Max, just on that point, I do want to come back to you, Michaela, because, okay, look, you know, we haven't heard too much from you yet, but I do, I just wanted to stick on that point. Max, you said right at the beginning, earlier on in the, in the, at the beginning of, of marriage, it's about the patriarchy, it's about preserving your wealth. Does it surprise you when Michaela says that among in her survey that high income families were and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Michaela, there was still a, 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 a what a, what what did you call it a huge supporting for marriage and they they want to get married. Yeah, well, high income families are there are many you know so eighty seven percent of high income families typically will be married and among our eighteen to thirteen year olds eighteen to thirty year olds who we surveyed said we want to be married they want it for themselves but it's the low income families. Right, so back. The low income. So does that feed into what you're saying, Max, about that hangover from patriarchy where wealth is transferred or kept in, in place through marriage? Definitely. Um, you, I mean, we know that arranged marriages, we know this from sociology and anthropology uh, rather than from psychology, that arranged marriages are primarily economic. I mean, look at the British royal family. You know, this is about power, control, bringing to uh, economic uh, and political regimes together. So that is pretty much when you've got something to do this, it's very much worth having a coalition, uh, and with people we would call that coalition uh, a marriage, whereas when you don't have a heck of a lot, which is Michaela's great point, I, I mean, I do agree, uh, people that don't have a lot have not got a lot to gain through marriage as much as wealthy people have to keep control and uh, to see the assets being I, I think, I think though, as well, if I could just jump in, I think actually it, it sort of has pushed them off their radar. I think, you, you know, Max, you mentioned the article, you talked about the fact that, you know, the government don't talk about it. It's not being something that's being raised. And actually, if you are a very low income, the way the benefit system works, you're actually, there's something called the couple penalty. And there's a great incentive to live apart because of your benefits. You can be up to £10,000 better off a year if you live apart part or you pretend to live apart because we know that also happens as well so the government aren't promoting encouraging marriage so it's almost it's shifted from their radar but i would say that actually one of the big differences is that for higher income families people know i'm not just talking really high income it's sort of middle income upwards there are still many marrying because you recognize the benefits of stability, of family stability, and that moment of commitment that you have when you say, yes, I'll get married to you, or civil partnership indeed is another form of that kind of long lasting commitment that you are hoping to achieve. Recognizing, of course, not all marriages, not all civil partnerships, but even more couples who can have it, they are far more or less are more likely to actually break up the marriages. So, so the importance of marriage is recognised by so many, but it isn't promoted and understood, and therefore by, by the government. Therefore, I think our low income families thinking, you know, actually financially, the government is saying, if I don't marry, I'll give you money. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'll just say to our viewers and our listeners, if you want to uh, call in and uh, add to this uh, you know, chat about marriage, please do. Um, what I want to talk about, we're going to take a, a break in just a moment. What I want to talk about, though, is something that somebody uh, sent in a message uh, and said, uh, somebody put here, for instance, 100% of divorces are caused by marriage. Uh, they're saying it's a money-making thing for clubs, hotels, lawyers, etc. And men don't like the role reversal. Marriage was stacked against women. Really pleased I didn't marry my sponging ex. What I want to talk about afterwards, well, after our break, is that we've had messages saying uh, men think that it's stacked against them because if they get divorced, they're the ones who have to move out. They're the ones who have to keep maintaining the the, uh, the, uh, the family and what have you. And that their children, they don't get to see their children. Uh, so that's one argument. Women, as we say here, they think it's stacked against them on the other side. So I want to talk about that. I also want to talk about this whole thing about in the last uh, 2021, there were more children born out of wedlock than in wedlock. My question being, if marriage is so fantastic, why is that? So uh, that's something else that I want to look at, just to put that into your, your mind. Now, um, the other thing is, uh, is uh, and because there's no stigma around it, that probably feeds into it. What was your other point that I wanted to talk about? The actual cost of getting married. I know you're, you're, you're saying that the government um, you know, it sort of gets against you, and they do. They don't support marriage through their their policies. But the actual cost of getting married, when there's so many other, uh, you know, things that you can pay out on, uh, and sexual liberation, and all of those things, we'll discuss that. Uh, do get involved to our our listeners and our watchers. We'll be back uh, with more on marriage in just a moment. Oh, our, our chat about marriage is firing you up, sure firing you up. Uh, joining me at the moment, we've got um, Michaela Hyde from the Marriage Foundation, and we also have uh, Max, and Max, I'm just shoveling amongst my paper, uh, Max as well, um, who's a psychologist who wrote a brilliant piece about it. Let me just, I, I mean, because I'm trying to multitask here, um, a bit like marriage, really. Uh, somebody said, lots of modern women want weddings not marriages. Staying together is a choice. The marriage certificate doesn't really do much. It's a bit of paper. Somebody else uh, sent a message in. You can commit without a piece of paper, exclamation mark, three of them. For goodness sake, exclamation mark, three, you know, three, uh, three exclamation marks there. So uh, coming to you, Michaela, what about that? I mean, you know, it, it, it's just a piece of paper, they're saying. And, and, you know, also they're saying lots of modern women want the weddings, not marriages. I think that's an interesting point. Yeah, I think um, that in terms of this whole sort of idea of marriage just being a piece of paper, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't go along with that. In as much as I think, when you, when two people come together, they make a decision about their future together. They sit down, and I, I talk about having this forever conversation, uh, where you think, okay, do we want to try and make this go the distance? And you make that choice together. And it's a bit like if you sign up to do the marathon or something, and you commit to it, and that. That process of commitment means you're far more likely to succeed and carry on. Now, at the Marriage Foundation, one of our big bits of research we've talked about before is that marriage is three times more likely to succeed compared with informal cohabitation. So clearly, marriage is not just a piece of paper. It does actually um, enable couples to stay together, which is good for them, and it's good for their kids. Of course, Alongside that, anecdotally, you'll be people will be listening, thinking, "Well, I know X, Y, and Z, and they're not married, and they're fine, and this person's married, and they've divorced." Yeah. Of course, those stories will be there because that's the nature of stats and research. But marriage. I was going to say, but, but I was going to. All right, I was going to ask you that. That's you. You touch upon that, Michaela, and I, I want to come back to Max here. If that, I, I, I'm not disagreeing with that, but then divorce rates are so high. Max, do you want to jump in there? Um, Michaela is going to jump in in a second and tell us that, that divorce rates uh, have coveted uh, over the last three years, I'm sure. Um, one of the reasons is that, uh, as was just pointed out, it's really expensive to get divorced, number one. Uh, and number two, fewer people are getting married, so there are relatively fewer people to get divorced in the first place. So there are a couple of reasons why we are seeing uh, this decline. Uh, going on and people couldn't uh, 
that we are interested uh, in getting to the horse. Um, but one of the things that interests me in this whole area, and I think you kind of alluded to it there, Tricia, is that um, when you stay married for a long time, you know, one can, people who are married stay longer than people who are not. Um, that's like saying, we are going to put you inside a, uh, a cage uh, or a prison of some kind. And it will be harder for you to leave that prison. Life may not be great for you in the prison, but because you've invested so much, you're less likely to be. Now, my question is, you know, that may be good for the kids, although I'd like to come back to that argument and say it's not marriage that's good for kids. It's a stable, happy relationship. And you don't have to be married to have a stable, happy relationship. But from the leaving perspective, sure, when you've invested that much, it's difficult to leave both good relationships and bad relationships. So then what happens is the kids get stuck inside a relationship that should have dissolved, but doesn't. And that's, as a psychologist, that concerns wow. Okay, so then lots of things I'd like to come back to on that. First of all, people marrying today, okay, their chances of divorce are down to about 35%. is a big drop. It is just because of the number of people marrying. Those who are marrying are staying together because there isn't the social pressure to marry. So there isn't the, oh, having a baby out of wedlock, I must get married. The people now that choose to marry are really making a decision around that. And the big difference is, I mean, are you married, Max? I don't know, I didn't hear whether you were married. X. Okay, so you talked about this cage. You see, I, I, I've been married for 24 years this year, and I have never, ever described oh, my marriage as a cage. So, but no, let me finish. Let me come back to that point. So what I'm going to say is that when people, two people choose to come together in marriage and they've got that process of deciding about the future, um, okay, they are imagining how life might look. It might not work. But when people move in together, they talk about some research in America called sliding and not deciding. So they sort of slide into this relationship. Let's see how this goes. But no kind of expectation about what the future might look like. And actually, inertia stops them from moving on from a relationship. They are more likely to be trapped in that scenario than in a marriage where from the outset there has been this intention that we want to be together. We recognise sometimes it might go wrong because we're human and we might need to come out of that. But actually, cohabitation can bring about this sense of inertia and feeling more trapped than you are in a marriage. And there's asymmetry okay. in a relationship as well, in a cohabiting relationship. All right, let me just ask you, let me go, Max, you, again, we just touched on that as well. So why is it that so many children, as I said, for 2021, more children were born out of wedlock than in wedlock? What's going on there, Max? Well, simply because the stigma of having a child outside of wedlock is not what it used to be. I think that we, we've seen a lot of research lately um, that the church uh, doesn't have the power that it used to. In other words, people don't identify with religion uh, as strongly as they did. And it was the church primarily, and, and in psychology research, we say one compared oneself to reference groups, in other words, your peers. And when you see your peers starting to have children outside uh, of marriage, then you think, well, nobody's going to be looking down on me uh, when I do it. Um, if, if I can just also respond to Michaela's uh, great point there about, you know, people getting married today may yeah. have a lower chance of, of getting divorced. That, that's because people are thinking far more carefully about getting married. Like, you know, the church has this uh, the PREPARE program, which I'm sure you're uh, aware of, and, and which I've been um, involved in researching as it happens, where you do that. However, that still isn't a reason to get married just because you're not going to get divorced. So in other words, say people, far fewer people are getting divorced. Great. But why are they getting married in the first? What are the actual benefits of being married? And again, if the answer is that kids are happier in marriage, I would argue that kids are happier because of the stable relationship, not because of the piece of paper. And I think that actually... Ah, okay, that you know, stability in the within a couple is what provides 
that sort of, you know, children to grow up and to achieve and to do all the things they'd like to do emotionally, developmentally, and, and so on and so forth. But what I'm saying is, it's far more likely that that will happen within a marriage than outside of that. It's not that it's not possible, but there are more constraints and more challenges within that. So I, I absolutely agree. It's stability of family that makes the difference for children but it's just more, far more likely to happen within couples who are married because we know that they are more likely to stay together all right so i i, I suppose i'm a bit of an, an anomaly or maybe i'm not um so i've been I, i'm i'm i've been married uh i am married fourth husband my children were born one was born at before you know to my then cohabiting partner who became my husband my second child was born within a marriage uh, within that um i've had you know i've been a single mom i obviously believe in marriage either that or i'm addicted to wedding cake um but you know i i and i've had time on my own in between so i've experienced the both but for my children marriage did not represent Stability. I absolutely entered those marriages at the time, believing they would last forever. I just have to pick. It's not all, all their fault, but the people I picked in didn't believe in marriage probably as much as me. And Max was making a point that for many men who want to uh, so continue to sow their seed, you know, continue to sow their seed, then marriage isn't for them. Now, that was my experiences in my earlier marriages. Uh, it took me a while. And I probably come into your your point here, Michaela, where I thought about it in a very different light. I had a hell of a lot of therapy, uh, and that my next marriage, I, I don't have to think about children because they're grown up. I don't have to think about financial stability. I don't have to do any of those things, uh, and I could be completely selfish about the person I married because I wasn't bringing children in. So I kind of represent what Max is talking about. Um, I feel that I'm disapproving, uh, uh, disapproving a bit about what you're talking about, but yet I still believe in marriage, so I sit in between. And uh, let me just read these messages. Um, oh dear. As a man, all I can say is that marriage is the stupidest idea ever. I mean, the prospect of having to put up with a nagging, moaning, whinging, whining, oh. greedy, useless, stupid, fat, lazy, waste of space to spend money like it's water is pretty awful. But I suppose if I can find a bird who's willing to put up with all of that, uh, I'll give that a go. I see the humour there. That's Mark in Norwich, my own, my own town. That's funny. Now, we, we did, do we have a caller? Did she, is she still there? Let me just say, let me just check with my producer if we had a a, a, a caller is here's a question to you max before we wrap it up is love enough because i know that there's the song what's love got to do with it is love a, a powerful enough reason to get married in psychology we say that there are a number of different types of relationships uh, there's purely sexual there's having somebody as a friend there's having this uh, love type of relationship. So all of those are valid reasons. In fact, research shows, quite interesting, that the most stable relationships are those where there is a practical, uh, a practical living arrangements work well together, that you like the same things, you're happy to be awake and asleep at the same time, you have the same values, etc. You just muck on well together in life. So love is not that criteria, it's kind of more about how do we get on. But just let me say, for your point of you know confusion, where you say, well, you know, these sort of male wives who want to be modern, so there's, uh, and yet you continue getting married. You know, some of that undoubtedly you know, <laughs> you could be the princess in the tower and this strong bloke coming to put you over the shoulder and all of this romantic stuff. But I've got nothing against I've really got that, actually, I have to say. <laughs> So good, good. Okay, um, but but there is something about I have nothing against marriage if people feel that it's a spiritual journey for them. And I don't want to go all airy fairy, but there's some higher ideal. If you feel that something will help you to actualize, I don't know, you know, I have to say that in normal words, but to become yeah, your, yeah. If you get that from marriage, I think that's an excellent reason. Not for the stability, not for the piece of paper, not for it. If it will help you to become your full self, that's a great reason to get married. I think. There's a lot of emphasis on on self, and I think actually part of a sense of self comes from what you when you share life with somebody else. And I think that 
that some of the things that you're you're talking about kind of it sort of distills it down into something that is not the reality of people's lived in experience and i think that people do marry because they they fall in love but that love isn't enough on its own love is about an action it's about kind of a process it's about a journey together it's about keeping on investing in one another and there are huge benefits of marriage that people enjoy in terms of that stability, but that stability is about friendship. It's about forgiveness. It's about caring for one another. And it's about being there for them through the highs and the lows. And again, I would argue that it's not about the piece of paper. It is about that moment of commitment. And there's the psychology of commitment for men is involving a decision. Women commit emotionally quite quickly. For men, it involves a decision. So in fact, almost marriage is even more important for men to actually say yes, because then you know they are really committed. If there isn't that point of commitment, if you've got two oh, wow. people living together, there's this asymmetry. And actually, the man is in greater power because they're saying, well, this is fine by me. And there's the female, more often than not, is the one that's saying, I'm going to put up with this, but I really want to be married. And that, that's one of the kind of you know tensions that you have living together, I would argue. But, but, yet, but yet, you know, you're saying that men are saying, yes, I'm committed, that's it. But then if that's the case, why cheat? Max, final word to you. Uh, I'll get you both to do a final word before we finish this. Max? So I, I think that uh, if men make the decision to get married and it comes far more naturally uh, to women, uh, men can just as easily decide to not be married uh, anymore. And, and I know that uh, from relationship counselling is that when a man withdraws from a relationship and they come into counselling, the relationship is usually savable. When a couple come in and the woman has withdrawn her heart from the relationship, it's over. Best to call the divorce and solicitors at that point. And I would say that the reality is about a couple, how people respond in a relationship. And what I would still argue is that scenario you described may be absolutely true, but it's still far more likely to happen among those who are cohabiting. Marriage is three times more likely to succeed compared with the informal cohabitation. More than 80% of our 18 to 30 year olds want to be married. And we've got this growing marriage gap among our lowest income families. And that matters because actually it impacts hugely on the development of their children and outcomes. And as parents, we all want the very best for our kids. And we're trying to seek that out and work that out. So in one respect, this kind of data, this information is there for our government to be informed and say, stop you know, this ridiculous couple penalty where you're giving the incentive for, for people who are on low incomes not to marry. Let's change that. Let's promote marriage and say why it's good and civil partnership and say why commitment matters. And it clearly does matter to ministers because the majority of them are married and the majority of them are benefiting from being married. Let's not pretend that marriage and cohabitation are the same things because they're not. And it does provide right. stability. But let's cheer on the low, low parent. Sorry, we've, we've got to leave it there, but I just say, you know, we're the Prime Minister when we had Boris Johnson. Um, you know, we, we haven't had time to go on to role models. I, I'd suggest that you wouldn't be likely to get a policy like that from uh, from him. Uh, but uh, I just want to thank you both. You both brought up some really interesting uh, issues. We're not even going to be able to get through all of the messages of, of what, what have you. Uh, so let me just remind you, we had...